Okay, I'm going to get us started again. Um, for those of you who've just joined us, welcome to session 9B of TSA's online conference for 2020. This is a series of individual papers about collections and archives. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be uh, introducing this and to be participating in this panel. I'm Melinda Watt, I'm the vice president of TSA. Um, I will just remind you to use, um, those of you in the audience, to use the Q&A if you have questions at any point during the, um, during the presentations. We will hold the questions until the end and then I will read them out to the presenters. So also please identify the presenter to whom you are asking a question. Um, if it is for someone specific. Um, we can't respond to raised hands because you are all, um, you are all uh, muted in this session. So um, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker who is Maria Cecilia Holtz. And the title of her paper is Borders of Empires, Hidden Stories from the Denman Ross Collection at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Maria. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you again to the organizers for uh, this wonderful conference and for navigating uh, through this uh, crisis with us in order for, uh, for us to be together. And I've had the pleasure of joining other uh, smaller panels leading up to this uh, conference uh, on textiles, and it has been a wonderful experience. I'm uh, going to speak to you today about the Denman Ross collection at the MFA. And um, it has been a delight to work um, with the MFA on several projects. And I must say that I came to work with the MFA uh, simply because of a love of reading um, uh, American literature. My background is in religious studies but uh, it was because I was reading Moby Dick and became interested in, um, in Abaca Rope that I came to the MFA because I heard that they had a collection of Abaca. And uh, lo and behold, they brought out, the textile department brought out their collection of Abaca textiles. And that is how I came to know the textile department and subsequently, their collections of uh, Denman Ross materials and other uh, textiles. Um, and I um, began to work with them on a project on colonial objects in, uh, for a conference in Denmark in Copenhagen. And, um, and that is how I came to know the mission of um, the MFA and uh, their commitment to education and to progressive uh, thinking in terms of what they have and the relationship between aesthetics and ethics. So let's move on. Um, I don't know how many of you know uh, Denman Ross, Denman W. Ross. Uh, no wing of the museum is named after him. No, uh, he's not famous for any, um, any foundation, any other institution, other than he helped to build the MFA itself by um, through his donation of some 11,000 objects. Uh, this is the MFA in its original building in Copley Square. Uh, in 1909, it moved it to its present location on Huntington Avenue. Now, Denman Ross's lifetime spanned uh, from just before the Civil War to encompass the First World War and the pandemic of the Spanish flu and uh, he died just before the Second World War. And uh, as you can see in this brief timeline, 
He uh, traveled a great deal, always to Europe, but also uh, extensively to Japan, Asia, uh, and Central America and South America. Um, one of the last books that was, uh, or more recent books that was written about him was by a relative of his, um, just written or just published before she died. Um, I can uh, email anyone who's interested. Um, it's the best of its kind by Patricia Pratt, uh, Ross Pratt. And um, it, it's more a family memoir and it offers a more extensive timeline. Now, in terms of Denman Ross and his world, um, one of the things that I found most interesting was that he found the best examples of pure design in textiles. And as one of the key, keynote speakers yesterday who spoke at noon uh, uh, demonstrated, one of, the, one of the exhibits that she curated in Brazil paired textiles with paintings. And I thought that that was a remarkable uh, example of one of um, Denman Ross's philosophies. Um, and Peruvian and Coptic textiles were among uh, his favorites. Uh, the education of Denman Ross was rather unique for its time. Here we have uh, Charles Elliot Norton, um, who gave one of the first classes in art history at Harvard, if not the United States. And we have also Henry Adams, who was uh, a historian of law and particularly medieval law institutions. And this would echo throughout uh, Demon Ross's own philosophy on design. In terms of Denman Ross and his circle, uh, can you hear me all right? I hope so. Yes, we can, thank you. In, in terms of Denman Ross and his circle, we have um, um, William Sturgis Bigelow, who is among the circle of uh, MFA, um, MFA significant MFA um, uh, persons, along with um, Fenelosa and others who built again the Japanese uh, collections in, in the MFA. We have Isabella Stewart Gardner, who as many people know, uh, built the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, but was a, an incredible uh, Boston uh, force in Boston arts. And we have his cousin, Louise Nathurst, who was his companion uh, for, for life and who traveled often with him. And this is a painting by Ross. And uh, I mustn't neglect to tell uh, the audience that um, Denman Ross was trained as a historian, but was first and foremost an artist and collector, as well as educator in the, in the fine arts. Along with his circle of friends, we have Louise, uh, Louis Brandeis, who became a justice in the Supreme Court, but was, who was also his counsel for a time. And um, we have stories of Brandeis attending um, art talks by Denman Ross given at his home. And uh, Corina Lin Linden Smith, who was uh, an archeologist and Joseph Linden Smith, they were lifelong friends of his as well. And uh, the Linden Smiths traveled extensively in um, Egypt and Africa and elsewhere, um, excavating uh, ancient ruins and painting them. Now, um, in the circles in which uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner and Denman Ross um, traveled, there was, of course, um, Bernard Berenson, 
who was the famous art dealer. And this we here is a postcard from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, um, which opened to the public in uh, 1903. Um, here is some uh, lace and I will begin to show examples of some of his, uh, what what ends up being his design. Uh, you can you can start to see Demon Ross's design uh, tastes through through some examples of lace and textiles that he collected. Now this particular lace here that I. I'm showing is um, this was purchased in 1893, and he and Denman Ross compared it to the windows of Chartres Cathedral. And I don't know um, if uh, how many of you uh, I'm sure are familiar with Henry Adams's um, raptures, own raptures about Chartres Cathedral and its importance in culture. Um, uh, but this is woven in a dull pink silk and gold. And um, if you are familiar with uh, Henry Adams's um, Mont Saint Michel and Chartres and his letters to his niece, you can see the influence on um, on uh, of Henry Adams on his student. And the importance of that particular book on a generation of men who, who traveled through Europe, through Asia, just as Henry Adams had done. Um, and he goes on and on about this piece of, piece of Sicilian weaving and its circles. And you'll see in his books and his exercises, uh, what these circles uh, would later mean to him and in his own tastes. And th this is the window of stained glass from Chartres. And uh, I'm sorry, the quote here from Henry Adams is, to feel the art of Mont Saint-Michel and Chartres, we have to be pilgrims again. And that is exactly what, um, what uh, Denman Waldo Ross did throughout his life until about 1924. And this is the piece of Peruvian textile that I really loved very much. Um, uh, this is a 16th uh, to 17th century textile with lace, uh, not actual lace, but lace designed uh, here in the border, uh, here along the border of the textile. And here's another piece of Peruvian tapestry. And, oh, and, the, uh, and here is a uh, old uh, Denman Ross painted by uh, one of his, one of his companions, um, household companions, along with uh, Louise Nathurst, uh, Kanji Nakamura, uh, who lived in his house until in his as part of his household until 1932. And um, finally, the influence of Denman Ross. And there's many arguments about that, but in uh, E.H. Gombrich's The Sense of Ornament, there is a footnote uh, that states that um, a theory of pure design uh, anticipates in some respects Kandinsky's Point in Line, um, which was published as a Bauhaus book and is still a basic um, followed, uh, basic course still followed in many art schools. And I think that um, uh, Marie Frank and other Dross scholars uh, kind of point to um, Denman Ross's emergence uh, and affiliation with the arts and crafts movement and how this also 
um, may have had an influence uh, would definitely an influence um, on them and Ross, but then also points to Kandinsky and um, and perhaps uh, Albers, Annie Albers. And as I look back on, um, and I, I also like Annie Albers, but I, I hadn't really seen the connection until I look back on um, and the MFA's uh, one piece on Annie Albers and dotted uh, the weaving. And then I saw very clearly how much Denman Ross might have liked any helpers. So I don't know if any of you um, might now see the connection between the two, but I'd, I'd welcome your opinion. And now a final note. Um, there is a very great friendship between Denman Ross and Elizabeth, uh, I mean, Isabella Stewart Garner. And for our time, um, I was very much moved by this letter um, by this letter of, uh, of Denman Ross to Isabella Stewart Gardner from December 23rd, 1918, that could be written now. And he writes, I have nothing interesting to offer you, dear Mrs. Gardner, only my best wishes, which come to you, um, which come to you from wherever I am and at all times. At this time, um, at Christmas and New Year, in which unprecedented things will happen and a new life will begin, I wonder where, I wonder whether we will like it, and and uh, whether whether there will be any promise in it of things which we will which we love and long for, you and I. And I thought that this is uh, a very interesting sentiment between two great giants of American culture in that time of uncertainty, 100 uh, and uh, just a little over 100 years ago, at a time when uh, the United States was experiencing a moment of vulnerability uh, in in uh, during a global pandemic and at the end of the war. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, our next speaker is Marcy Farwell, and the title of her talk is Reweaving the Textile Archive, Building Diverse Collections on the Legacy of the American Textile History Museum. Marcy? So um, I just want to say this is my first Textile um, Society of America symposium, and I've just been blown away by the panels that I've seen, and I'm really looking forward to going back and viewing some of the ones I didn't see. So I'm really honored to be here today. Um, my official title is the Osborne Textile Industry Curator at the Kiel Center, which is located at Cornell University. And I am the first person to hold this title, and that is because I oversee the collections that were formerly part of the American Textile um, History Museum uh, located in Lowell, Massachusetts. And those um, collections came to us when that museum closed in 2017. So many of you here already know this, um, but uh, for those of you who don't know, the American Textile History Museum was located in Lowell, Massachusetts, one of the major uh, textile manufacturing centers in the United States from the 19th through the 20th centuries, along with its sister city, Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, both are situated in the Merrimack uh, River Valley uh, west of Boston. The museum began collecting in the early 1960s as many of the mills in the area began to close, move to the southern United States, or to emerging global textile centers, which is where they remain largely today. One of the reasons why these corporate archives are available to the public is because um, many mill uh, excuse me, many of the textile companies, including, including many of the mill owning families, uh, founded the museum as a way to preserve the history of the Merrimack Valley and the textile industry in the Northeastern United States. One of the things that made the ATHM especially unique was that it was a library, archive, and museum uh, collecting a wide range of materials. While the museum and archives concentrated on materials and costumes 
related to um, the textile industry in the Northeast and the United States, the library contained tens of thousands of books on textiles worldwide. Sadly, the very thing that made it special made it hard, um, made it difficult to find another institution that could take um, the entire collection when the institution had to close to, due to financial difficulties. In 2017, eight tractor trailers carrying roughly 6,000 cubic feet, so a cubic foot, foot is roughly one of those banker boxes that you might see at Staples, so just to think about 6,000 of those, arrived at the Kiel Center for Labor Management Documentation and Archives at Cornell University. The Kiel Center acquired these materials because of its particular strengths in collecting the records of unions related to textile and garment manufacturing. This edition offers scholars at the Kiel Center a unique insight into the American textile industry in the 19th and 20th centuries from both the management and labor perspective. Additionally, Cornell offers a degree in, in fashion and apparel design through the College of Human Ecology, formerly Home Economics, so the collections from ATHM will also be important resources for those students. So now you wanna know, what did we take? Cause we didn't take it, we didn't take everything. I wish we could have, but unfortunately we couldn't have. So we did take the bulk of their library and archives. So the bulk of their library, it's about 30,000 volumes um, and an extensive collection of books relating to textiles on any, every conceivable subject. Um, walking these, the aisles in, um, our offsite storage facility where they're located now is kind of a, one of my personal joys. Um, from animal husbandry, which were popular with the group of local fiber artists and sheep and alpaca farmers that came to visit in January, my last on-site visit before COVID hit, to city directories um, for many of the main mill towns, to more recent publications that were released shortly before the museum closed. These will not all be located at the Kiel Center because of the range of subject matter those books will be distributed across the Cornell University libraries, but tagged with ATHM so that the library will essentially stay together virtually, if not physically. Additionally, we took about 5,000 cubic feet of manuscript collections. And when I say manuscript collections, I'm also including business records, graphics, photographs, postcards, blueprints, and weaving drafts. So a lot of material. 80% um, of these are these are rough estimates, but about 80% are textile producing company records, so essentially corporate records from the mid 19th through the mid 20th centuries. 15% are textile organizations such as the National Association of Wool Manufacturers. And then about 5% um, of the items are letters from mill workers, student work and draft books. We also took about a thousand cubic feet of sample books. Um, and we only took the samples from the companies where we have the corresponding records. So that left us with woolen samples, corduroys, upholstery fabrics, and dye test books. Um, and because we get a lot of questions for those of you who are interested in the, um, the printed cottons, those went to the Henry Ford Museum. They, they also took the bulk of the trade catalogs. And if you're interested in sort of the pre-industrial materials such as dye, dye recipe books, um, or some of the earliest sample books, those all went to the Winterthur Museum. So if you have questions about where things that you know were there ended up, feel free to contact me. I do have my contact information at the end of my presentation. Um, but while books and boxes fill the vault, stories are at the heart of every archival repository. And the mission of the Kiel Center is to document the world of work. And the mission of the ATHM had been to tell America's story through the art, science, and history of textiles. As the Kiel Center continues and develops those missions, we move beyond America's story to take a more global perspective of the worker. Large editions like that that came from the ATHM are opportunities to rethink collecting strategies, description practices, and instruction in order to align with present day strategy that center around diversity and sustainability. For while the majority of Americans may be removed from garments and textiles as an industry, the story of the textile industry is critical to understanding the course of modern history. The transformation of the industrial revolution reached every level of society, from the enslaved people that grew and picked the cotton to the barons of industry that owned and operated the mills and factories. The textile industry was one of the engines that drove the industrial revolution in Great Britain and the United States and continues to drive globalization today. Currently, one of the most used collections at the Kiel Center is that relating to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire when 
um, yeah. When 145 people died in March 1911, mainly immigrant women, it changed America's view on labor law forever. Newspapers heavily reported the fire and many Americans saw themselves, their sisters or their daughters in the women that lay dead on that cold New York City sidewalk. Today, the global nature of this industry means that most consumers do not feel an immediate impact by events occurring half a world away. Using the records from the ATHM, we can make connections between historical events like the Pemberton Mill collapse in 1860, which until the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire was the largest disaster connected to the textile and garment industries in the United States, but is largely forgotten today. And the image on your screen is a record from, from one of our collections. And more recent events like the Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh in 2013, in which over 1,100 people died. And when I, I had a class just last week and I brought up the Rana Plaza collapse, none of the students knew what it was. Um, so this is really important things to bring up in classroom because, which brings me to my next point, time passes and without an understanding of history, people can forget the battles fought for labor and environmental laws and the people those battles and laws left behind. They may lose touch with the fact that while the textile and garment industries offered many women and immigrants their first jobs, it has, from its inception, too often exploited those women and immigrants, as well as children and people of color for their labor. In the year and a half I have been in this position, I have focused on processing that 6,000 cubic feet of material and making it available to researchers. But as a curator, I must also ask myself, where do I go from here? Fortunately for me, in 2019, the Cornell University Libraries went through their own time of reflection and aligned their strategic initiatives with those of the 2030 UN Sustainability Goals. The UN goals take a broad view of sustainability, connecting the need to address the environmental causes of climate change to the human costs of things like hunger, inadequate housing, poverty, and equal access to education. All 17 of the sustainability goals listed by the UN apply to the people and industries connected to the garment and textile manufacturing. And they offer the opportunity to use that fundamental need for change to guide collecting strategies at the Kiel Center. For at the heart of the need for change in the textile and garment industries is fast fashion, which the seeds of which are planted in Lowell in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Fast fashion or cheaply made and widely available clothing continues to have an enormous impact on social and environmental sustainability worldwide. Statistics attesting to that abound. Production of one cotton shirt uses enough water for one person to drink for two and a half years. And then I think of how many shirts I have in my closet. Um, fashion trends that change twice to four times per year now change 50 to 100 times per year. So it's not surprising that consumers in 2014 bought 60% more than they did in 2000, but kept each garment half as long. Most workers at the bottom of the garment and textile supply chain are people of color from current or formerly colonized countries such as India, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. 80% of those are the world's poorest women. And in the US, since the 13th Amendment abolished slavery except in the case of those imprisoned, prisons here have become a source of cheap labor for the garment and textile industries. While this industry allowed for the democratization of access to clothing and textiles, it has also long come in conflict with the environment and fair labor practices. It is often the people working in the mills and factories, as well as people living in nearby towns that were the first to feel the effects. Using material from the ATHM and its union collections, the Kiel Center can now show our patrons that the fair labor and environmental laws that protect them in the United States, at least most of them, result from an ongoing struggle since the start of the industrial revolution. In her book, Sustainable Fashion and Textiles, Design Journeys, the author Kate Fletcher attributes this exponential growth to the Western idea of progress presented by corporations and how they sell their products, as well as to the meaning people place in the things they buy. She suggests that people often feel better when they own more, even if those things are disposable. So the question becomes, how do we find, how do we change the current feeling we, of success we get when we accumulate things to the feeling we can get when we find more value in the things we already have. As part of an answer to this, Fletcher is among a growing attempt to create a slow fashion movement. The goal is to make and mend more of what you wear, buy it secondhand, or from makers who pay fairly and use environmentally friendly business practices. Slow fashion alone will not solve all of the problems of the modern textile and garment industries. 
but collecting materials related to this movement offers important tools we can use to teach students and other users about the connections between sustainability and social responsibility. These collections can offer an opportunity to critique the slow fashion movement and the ways it can be used for greenwashing or be too expensive for working class consumers, to converse with students about ways to address some of its shortcomings and offer ongoing solutions to the global issues surrounding this industry. Since this is an area I know I wanna document, last summer I began by collecting the websites of the existing textile mills in the United States. From the large companies that supply the US military to the smallest mills processing wool from local farmers. I also included local, excuse me, included organizations dedicated to sustainable fashion, such as regional fiber sheds and fair trade organizations. And this is an ongoing web archiving, web archiving project. So when I find organizations, I add them. Um, I also joined several colleagues at Catherwood Library. Um, that's the library for the School of Industrial and Labor Relations where Kiel is situated and another web archiving projects related to work in COVID-19. The impact of the pandemic has been devastating for those who make your clothes, many of whom haven't been paid since it started. These are the hidden aspects of the textile industry, ones that we as consumers don't always want to face. Organizations such as the Clean Clothes Campaign, Workers' Rights Consortium, and Fashion Revolution are working to bring them into light and important to collect and preserve. And the records that came from the ATHM are letters from the mill workers that are some of the few ways we get glimpses into the life of the textile industry from the mill workers point of view. It is one of the few places women's voices can be heard since, rare, since they rarely held places of power within the mills and factories, a hierarchy that remains today. In this letter, Sarah Page writes to her cousin Mary shortly after her arrival in Great Falls, New Hampshire, where she's begun working in the mill. She writes that she likes her work, but is homesick. She also notes that smallpox is raging in Dover and the mills, meeting houses, and schools have been shut down. Separated by nearly 150 years, we don't seem so far apart. It is those stories that inspire me to think about the voices that are absent from the garment and textile collections. The textile and garment industry has always existed in a world of extreme wealth and power differentials. From the children who worked in the earliest mills, sometimes plucked from the workhouse, to the modern prison industrial complex, and finally to the textile workers in Bangladesh, those at the bottom of the supply chain have very little presence in contemporary archival collections. While the records of the ATHM include letters and diaries written by New England mill workers accounting their experiences, the average worker likely did not see their stories as worth saving or have the means to preserve them. Therefore, the vast majority of the 5,000 cubic feet of material represent the story from the mill owner's perspective. In her article, Archival Amnesty, in search of Black American Transitional and Restorative Justice, Tonya Sutherland states that, just as archivists create the archive, so too do they influence what narratives and stories can and cannot emerge from the archives. Sutherland argued that traditional archives need to take, actively look outside of themselves for evidence they may have missed historically. And in so doing, opportunities may arise to document Black and other marginalized communities by recognizing different modes of records creation, records keeping, and working with communities to find the most suitable ways to document their cultural heritage. One of the most important things marginalized communities can do is force archivists to confront the very nature of collecting and remembering. As a side note, listening to some of the panels this week, I've been reminded just how much of women's voices and outsider voices have literally been stitched and yet the vast majority of archives would not accept that as a quote, traditional record. And I think textiles have an important place in the conversation of unconventional forms of record keeping, excuse me, unconventional forms of record keeping. Looking outside of what is considered traditional record keeping has long been a crucial aspect of the LGBTQIA archives, but the idea is spreading to other areas of archival collecting. In discussing the role of the archive, the writer Ann Setkevich wrote, queer archive activism insists that the archive is not just a repository for safeguarding objects, but is also a resource that comes out into the world to perform public interventions. This approach allows for collaboration with stakeholders and presents an opportunity for traditional archives to build more diverse and engaged user communities, close gaps and add a new dimension to archival collecting and description. My hope is to use the additional funding that came from the Osborne Foundation for use on these collections 
to create fellowships that allow us to invite scholars, artists, researchers, and community members to help us add to the experiences that are missing from the records. In the case of the Kiel Center, it might be a way to include the experiences of prison laborers and those working in the mills and factories in fast fashion today. Additionally, I looked at technological advances to add those voices. The work of the Kiel Center in acquiring the material related to the textile industry cannot end with merely bringing in the collections. As a way to celebrate the acquisition of the ATHM collections, 2022 was set to become the year of textiles at Cornell University Libraries, with nearly every unit library creating participating exhibits. Students and outside artists were to be involved, and we'd hope to hold symposiums like this one. COVID has meant the future of that year is unknown, but COVID has also brought conversations like these that offer inspiration in how we can share our work and resources with one another in no, new ways. It has been a time of enormous questioning and reflection on how we can make our work more representative our, of our current and future users as a way to keep the collections that had formerly belonged to the ATHM together virtually, we had already been planning a database of this patchwork with the major repositories where the material ended up contributing. But I recently came across Professor Kimberly Jenkins Fashion and Race Database as when, and was inspired by the work she and her colleagues are doing to cross boundaries and uncover hidden stories in fashion. We have a tendency in archives, libraries, and museum to want ownership of a collection, to call it ours. During the time of COVID-19 reflection, I began to wonder what it would mean to look past that to a future of collecting and dissemination that is shared. The Fashion and Race Database offers a glimpse into what the future of collecting materials related to the garment and textile industries might look like. One that is not limited by the boundaries of a single institution. One that is virtual. One that can offer experiences we cannot get in one repository alone or indeed within the academy alone. A database of the textile and garment industry should be as wide and deep as the industry itself, one that crosses oceans and spans decades. It can and should include those voices that are too often missing from our collections. One of the major issues repositories are facing are the ways in which we have commodified and sadly off and often too often colonized collection building. When we move away from what we own to what we can amplify, we open up more doors and experiences to our users. Like global warming or any other large scale problem, also known as wicked problems, there are no easy solutions to the modern textile and garment industries. The history of those industries, the experience of the people working in them, the discussion around those problems and the people who are working to overcome those problems are worth collecting and sharing. I also hope that at some point in the not too distant future, maybe even during that awaited year of textiles, we can meet in person. In the meantime, it is important for anyone working in archives and indeed in life to keep in mind that archival work is a continuous intellectual endeavor. It must be iterative. It continually reflects deeper understandings of people, records, events, and the relationships between them. It is responsive to users. It is flexible, reflecting changes in knowledge, practice, and values. Archivists will have to tear out and mend some of the things we have made. We will be wrong and we will miss things. We learn, we grow, we tend our loom. Thank you very much, Marcy. Our final speaker for this panel, for this session, is Angara Thomas. And the title of her talk is Hidden Stories in the Collection of the Knitting and Crochet Guild of the United Kingdom. Thank you. OK. First of all, um, let me say how much I've enjoyed the um, other presentations in this session. Um, so um, I just hope that I can uh, make an intelligent addition to those. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, the collection of the Knitting and Crochet Guild of the UK, where I'm a, a volunteer textile archivist um, uh, uh, two days a week. Um, first of all, um, having, having spent uh, more or less my whole career in either education or textile, sometimes both together. Um, so I want to first of all introduce the collection and tell you a little bit about it so that you get uh, some sense of what we have. And then I want to tell you about ways in which we're planning and trying to get it out uh, to, to people who would be interested in it. So um, 
I'm slightly disconcerted because I've got other things on my screen. Um, but never mind. I'm assuming you haven't got them. So yeah, we're seeing your view. It looks great. Thank you. Okay, fine. Um, so the um, Knitting and Crochet Guild of the UK, as you can see from your screen, is a membership organisation. goes back to the late 1970s when similar guilds and organisations were set up for crafts, both in the UK and uh, in the States as well, with a remit for preservation and innovation and education. Um, we cover hand and machine knitting and crochet. In 1990, an exhibition um, led to um, a body of, of textiles being collected and it was decided to start a collection then, um, which had then expanded to include absolutely every aspect of uh, knitting and crochet activity, tools and gadgets, uh, publications and yarns and shade cards. So, The collection is very broad in what we have. It's also very, very deep. So depending on how you're counting it, our textiles number about 2000. They cover garments, um, household textiles, um, art pieces and decorative panels. Our publications we think are the biggest in, certainly in the UK, um, as you can see, a, a lot. Worth mentioning in publications, we have mostly those that have been printed and, and distributed, but we also have quite a lot of grey literature, um, especially in machine knitting. A lot of people in the 70s and 80s self-published. That tends not to be digitised and it, it, it would be lost relatively easily. So I think that's an important aspect. Um, all sorts of tools and gadgets, ranging from very finely made um, objects to wind yarn and so on, to things made that were given as free gifts with magazines. And then yarns and shade cards, we hope will become a resource for all fashion and textiles researchers because uh, we can date quite a lot of them. So a useful resource there. So, the significance of the collection, I think, relates to all those things um, uh, because so much of it is, is domestic production. And um, that's where it's come from. It's come from personal, individual um, people's donations. Often seen as second best or inferior to shop bought or store bought. Them. So, Often also, uh, prior to the real onslaught of globalization in maybe the mid 1980s, um, made as an economic necessity, you couldn't afford to go and buy a garment, but you could make it, you could knit it or the same thing for household textiles. Maybe you couldn't afford a lace tablecloth, but you could either crochet or knit it. So because of these factors, very often these things became worn out or thrown away. We have very, very few uh, children's clothes and men's clothes, men's uh, garments because of these things. They were just worn out. And I think uh, personally, particularly knitting and crochet has suffered from these hierarchies of craft and art. Um, in a way that I think probably quilting has uh, been able to resist. Okay, where are we? We're in Yorkshire, in, in the UK. The building you're looking at is in the middle of what I would call a post-industrial village. It was, it was a, a mill building. We have the middle floor, part of the middle floor of that building. The village itself is an, is now becoming or was before covid a destination um so we are are an attraction for visitors um who can come and make a visit to our collection and also do other things in the village there's a canal and there's there's shops and cafes 
it's important to us to be there. We moved it nearly a couple of years ago and it should make a lot of difference to face-to-face uh, -face interactions with the collection. Okay, so what have we got? Um, the, the next couple of slides are just to try to give you a, um, a sense of, 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 of how much we have. On the left, you see um, a picture of our deep store, which has, that's a wall of racking that has uh, textiles. You can see it's classified by, um, sometimes by garment type and sometimes by designer with photos on to show what's in each box. Um, very useful. And then on the right, just a tiny, tiny bit of our publications and paper store. Again, you can see the patterns alphabetical and with, with numbers indicating. Another couple of shots, again, a wall where we've got our tools and gadgets, some of them. And then on the right, the library, pretty much 100% in English. Um, uh, and up on the top shelf to the left, you can see some of that grey literature, often uh, rather clunkily produced, um, typewritten and comb bound. All the work for the, all of the guild um, is done by volunteers, um, including these are the collection volunteers. Um, we're celebrating Christmas um, and wearing our party hats. I got permission to show you this. So why do we need stories? Well, I'm sure that um, as somebody said yesterday that she's uh, thought she was probably uh, preaching to the choir, um, but for all the reasons that you can see on the screen. Um, interestingly enough, when the uh, collection was started, um, stories weren't particularly um, collected. They, they were rather thought to be um, it was all a bit sort of confidential. So uh, even the name of the donor wasn't usually used when things were shown or, or, or exhibited. Um, I think there's been very much a, a change in the fashion of curating and stories are seen now to be an important and vital part of interpreting a collection. Um, and we very much feel that is the case um, in the Knitting and Crochet Guild collection. It's a way to engage audiences, it's a way to um, exhibit and show how important these things are. And uh, for me, they embody so many countless, countless hours of mainly women's labour because we're looking back to the mid 20th century and maybe to the late 19th century, more or less with what we have. So how do we collect and tell our stories? These are the main ways um, that I've identified. Um, and I'll talk through these now. Um, one by one. So, um, oops, has your whole screen gone? Okay. Um, now, when we um, receive donations, we make sure that we get as much information as we can um, about, about them. And these came to us, this little group of things came to us in 2019. There are about 30 um, sample tops to pattern stockings, to knee length stockings that are hand knitted. And um, they, I, th I think they're one of our very few donations that is from um, what I would call a member of the aristocracy that they, they were titled people. And uh, so they lived in London and they lived in Scotland. I suppose you could think Downton Abbey, but probably not quite that fancy. Um, and these were worn for hunting, shooting and, and fishing. So the family were absolutely thrilled when, when we said we'd be interested in having them. And we've got a personal notebook, which you can see underneath. 
and shade cards and the little gadget for counting the rows. And we found out a lot about when these, when they knitted and, um, and who wore them and so on. So we try to do that now as, as much as we can when we take objects in and um, we will actually take something, even if it's a duplicate of something we've got already, if we have better provenance and better stories with it. My forward button isn't working and I've no idea why. Oh, that's it. Okay, so we tell stories um, when people visit, um, which up until COVID, they were doing. We could accommodate small groups um, at the collection, and we also like to go out and have trunk shows and speak to larger groups of people, either in a lecture format or a talk and uh, showing garments. So these three little garments, hand-knitted in Shetland, um, we concentrate on domestic production, but in fact, it's it's a blurred um, category because these are would be knitted domestically, but for sale um, as part of uh, providing an income for the knitters. So that's a blurring that we can live with. Um, we know that both the donor and the uh, donor's parent uh, mother wore these garments they were bought in edinburgh in the very um in a department store in central edinburgh but knitted in shetland so they're absolutely gorgeous examples of of hand knitting and color work and construction but the fact that they've been worn and there's evidence of that in them makes them even more precious, um, we think, and, and our visitors think that too. It goes the other way as well. Um, we have, uh, we, when we have visitors, they, they tell us things that we didn't know. And um, a, a person who was researching early plastic came to look at some of our wool holders which are made of um, Bakelite, I think. Um, and apparently this wool holder, which you can see the blue plastic thing, that the bottom on the screws and you put your ball of wool in it and then the end comes out of the top and it keeps it in one place and it keeps it clean and stops it from rolling around. And so apparently really useful on long haul flights, not that anybody's taking those at the moment. Um, but very, very difficult to make because the bottom screws on to the to the top bit and uh, they they contract at different speeds when it's being made. And apparently it's really hard to get it so that the, the screw mechanism works properly. So we find things out as well. Um, incidentally, if you like um, vintage um, knitting uh, tools, you can see some uh, row counters on the table as well. So we also, wherever we can, um, publish uh, stories and, and tell people about the collection. Um, we had a piece in, in Piecework, which I'm sure a lot of you will, will know. Um, and uh, told about the collection and told some of our stories as well in that. And then, um, thanks, um, Slipknot is our own publication. We got a, um, a grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund, which is the logo in the bottom right of your screens. And we have gone on to social media because we can reach far, far more people if we're out there. So we got a grant and we, we structured it around the collection in 100 objects. Now, it's not an original idea, but it's a great way to do it. 
And from late January to the 30th of April this year, we put up one item from the collection right across all sorts. You can, that's a screenshot of our Instagram feed. That is still on. So if you go on Instagram, the, the handles at the end, you can find all of those. And if you click on, you get a, a paragraph about the object as well. It's also on our website. We have a closed Facebook group. They went up there too. It's closed, but it's by invitation. So there's also a blog, which one of the volunteers maintains. There's a lot on that. And again, the URLs on the end. Um, so in a pandemic, it's quite ironic in a way, because as somebody else said, I think we have been able, we haven't been going to the collection and doing those sort of routine tasks of getting things out and putting them away and so on. But we've met on Zoom and we've done a lot of long term planning. We've made short videos. Um, we've we're now collecting stories again via Zoom. Um, two students, we have students on placement from Huddersfield University. Um, and our chair are interviewing to capture stories about the collection and about things in the collection, because we know how important it is um, to write, to get things not just written down, but recorded so that that provenance and those stories don't get lost in the way that we saw earlier on. Um, and these are our... Um, handles and you can contact us and we're very keen to contact people and to to maintain an online presence because obviously through Instagram and so on um people can add to those stories and say oh I knitted one like that or oh I had one and I lost it or you know all those things slightly more significant that that people know and feel about um, this part of our textile history, which I think is, is so important and can so easily be lost. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to all of you um, speakers on this panel. Um, I found that this is, I personally, and I think the audience will agree, that um, this is really such a moving collection of stories about lives and objects that might otherwise be lost if it wasn't for your work and the work of your the colleagues that you're working with um, and your um, your organizations and your institutions. Um, I'm going to turn to the questions now and I'm just going to do them in order, the order in which they were received. Um, so I will start with a question for um, Maria Cecilia Ari, the um, Denman Ross Collection at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. Um, and she writes that um, this is um, Elena, perhaps Elena Phipps out there. Um, the objects that came to the museum through Ross have a requirement that they never leave the museum <laughs> building. Um, yeah. In other words, no museum's allowed to borrow them. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight as to why he had such a strong mandate regarding the museum's loan policy? Um, I, actually, Jennifer Swope and I were uh, from the MFA were speaking about that last night, and we were also wondering about that mystery. And as, and as many of you may know, Isabella Stewart Gardner also uh, has a mandate about not moving anything from her museum. And um, I don't know whether it's a matter of personal taste or not that uh, in that period, that nothing be moved um, uh, from anywhere. And, uh, but I uh, quickly searched through the family book uh, here, the family memoir, and, but I couldn't find the page, but there was one intriguing suggestion that during, uh, that right. during Denman Ross's own lifetime, he had a little sneaky way of moving uh, one object, at least one object, um, maybe from one place to another in his own exhibit of his own work um, in his own lifetime, maybe by writing himself a little note saying, I'm going to take this with me. Uh, but I couldn't find the, the reference at this time. So in his own lifetime, maybe he could give himself a, 
make himself alone of his own object, but, um, but not afterwards. And I think that, uh, I don't know whether it was the fashion among collectors at that time, uh, not to move objects, but I'm not sure. Uh, and it's worth, it's worth investigating, certainly. Right, I would just speculate that um, his being such a dedicated and, and in many ways forward thinking um, collector um, and um, theorist that he might not have put such a restriction on the collection were he were he alive today. Right. I, yeah, he, I, I think so. I think so. I think you're right. Um, so our next question is also um, for you. Um, this is from Ann Peters, who oh. thanks you for, yes. for the lovely paper. And I should say that there are many, many words of thanks and compliments to all of you in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, so, uh, in 1919, 1920, um, Julio Cesar Teo yes, and yes. Philip Ainsworth Means were together in Lima working yes. on an exhibition for yes. the new National Museum, which mm -hmm. did not come to pass. Right. Sounds like you're familiar with this. Um, have you seen evidence that Denman Ross met with them during his visit? I, I did not. Um, I was not able to go to the Harvard archives uh, because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, the only, uh, so that's very unfortunate for me, um, but the only letter that I did uh, see was from Denman Ross to Isabella Stewart Gardner, um, in which he writes from Lima saying that he was there to, uh, to purchase and collect more textiles uh, to add to his collection at the MFA. So that is the only, um, that is the only evidence I have that he was at, uh, in Lima for the purpose of, of uh, purchasing and collecting. So um, I know that um, uh, Anne Peters is, is uh, the expert on, on Peruvian textiles and, and I very much uh, long to uh, continue the conversation with her uh, to see uh, whether indeed um, you know what what other pieces of uh, archival material that we should uh, consult to to um, to obtain a possible um, evidence of potential contacts. But I, I do know that he was there during that that period. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and hopefully when the archives open up, you might find an answer. Yes, yes. Um, so um, for Marcy, um, you mentioned that when you spoke to students that they didn't know about the Rama Plaza disaster, but did they know, did they have any knowledge about the Triangle Shirtwaist fire? So mostly yes. And the reason okay. we actually do, one of our biggest users for our Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire ex online exhibit our K through 12 instructors. It's actually a pretty big component of um, American history. So um, most students maybe don't understand the full context of like that happening in regards to the labor movement, but they do know about the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. Um, so, and I, but I think a lot of that has to do with standard, standard history books in the United States. <laughs> sure. Um, so also for you, Marcy, um, what became of the textiles collected at the um, American Museum of, of uh, Textile History? So um, we, were, we were lucky in that fact that we were able to take the bulk of the library and archives. Mm -hmm. On the museum side, on the textile side, they were a lot more dispersed. So there was not one institution that took the bulk of them or even just a few institutions that took the bulk of them. They really were um, unfortunately much more widely distributed. Um, and so if there's questions about, about a particular textile, um, I can certainly um, find where that textile ended up. I do have a list, but that's one of the reasons why I wanna create that sort of online database mm -hmm. so that um, everyone essentially has access to the information about where um, the bits and pieces of that um, collection. I think like Lauren sort of said, said it really nicely is that you do need to have an understanding of, of how these collections, like where these collections came from and their sort of um, historical um, ownership and sort of to keep that lineage intact. And so that's part of one of the reasons why I wanna create 
um, that time uh, of that type of database so that everyone can have access to where those materials ended up. Right. So I just want to make sure I understand you correctly that you have the information about where all of the textiles did go to different museums and that you're working to make that available. It's about like a 6,000 page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I know. It's not, really accept- it's not accessible. We have a rule at Cornell that anything we put online has to be accessible. So unfortunately, it's mm-hmm. just not quite quite there yet. Right. But, um, but yes, That's- we do have that. And that is um, hopefully something we can do in the near future. Right. So you have it. And that is the intention. Yes. That's fantastic. Yes. I mean, I know I can, I know that textiles, a, a large number went to the MFA Boston um, to Winterthur. Um, I don't know if textile objects went to the Henry Ford Museum to the, um, some, some. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think, you know, many of us and other people could probably add to that, but it's fantastic to know that there is in one place, a comprehensive list. I do also want to give a shout out to the women who worked at the 18th mm. who closed, um, primarily Claire Sheridan. She, they worked tirelessly to um, make this distribution as seamless as possible and to document where all of these things ended up. So um, I really do wanna sort of acknowledge their work because without it, we really wouldn't know. And, um, and, and that like they, we are able to sort of promote these collections and describe these collections because they did such a good job of doing that work at the, at the American Textile History Museum. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is for Lauren um, from Jennifer Neeling. Loved your talk, exclamation point. Um, such interesting and important sleuthing work. Um, and I absolutely concur. Um, how did you learn that Cleveland held the Shabelsky textiles if they didn't know the provenance? And you should love to hear more about your research methods and how you track down the textiles in various places. Um, and I will just say that I am thrilled to hear your talk as well, because I think I was probably the person who spoke to Robin <laughs> to um, kind of get this all started. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I didn't want to name you if you didn't want to. No, 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 that. that's yeah. fine. I'm, I'm, I am delighted to have, um, to have sparked your project and you have, um, you've gone so much farther than um, anyone else I know in the United States in terms of, um, in terms of uh, unearthing this. So please do talk more about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as Melinda said, she, um, she had sort of been given um, some Shabelsky textiles through the Brooklyn and um, the Met were starting to work together um, to house that collection and um, I believe you found one of the, the exhibition catalogs and said, well, this says that Cleveland has a bunch of um, the Shabelsky textiles and reached out to um, the conservator at the Cleveland Museum of Art, um, who I worked very closely with. And um, she, she, she said, I, I know this collection in and out and I've never heard of these textiles. Um, and so then she went and um, got in touch with the um, archive at the museum, the Ingalls Library and Archive. Um, and so it's thanks to them that they were actually able to pinpoint um, the accession numbers. And we got, you know, rolling from there. And so I worked very closely with the archive to dig up everything that they had. Um, and it was really just a matter of when the collection came in, it came in under the name um, Pushkin, and somehow that's that's like where we we were able to because we we were able to find out okay well Pushkin and Shabelsky had some sort of relationship we were sort of able to weed together um, which was Shabelsky um, and I, I I reached out to um, so the MFA Boston to the curators there um, and the Brooklyn Museum and I was able to just having that being able to reach out to somebody and say hey do you know anything about this um, that was extremely helpful um, because you know sometimes you you do get stuck and there's there's nothing really published on this or um, 
um, you know, the archives aren't available, what have you. Um, so just being able to network with people and just putting yourself out there, um, even when you're an intern, I find that, um, you know, we all, we all sort of want the same thing and in, in, in having these collections be unveiled. Um, where, where I was able to find a lot of the ones that were auctioned um, out of the museum and um, I was able to find that um, the one of the owners, Natalie Farm and Pharma, who I mentioned, um, and she was also very helpful and excited to learn about her own, you know, now her collection. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it's really just, you know, finding the people who can, I think, help you um, piece things together. Uh, that was, that was one of the main things. So I'm very grateful to everybody that responded to my emails um, so that I could sort of piece this uh, story together. Well, again, congratulations. You, you got much farther than, um, than anyone at the, at the Met did when I was working there. Um, and she, yeah, so fantastic. Um, so the next question is for Maria again. Um, Rachel Stewart says, I believe Ross and Gardner were worried that their objects would be deaccessioned later, especially the highly coveted objects like the old master's paintings. Mm -hmm. They fought hard to buy the objects. So it made sense that they would be protective of them. I don't know if you, you know, if you want to expand on that or agree with that statement. Well, yes, I think so. And in fact, well, uh, one of, um, I mean, uh, how do I say, um, there were tremendous, um, there were tremendous gifts, uh, tremendous purchases that Ross um, made in particular. And um, one of them, uh, I think uh, Chinese scrolls uh, were bought uh, with uh, loans against his estate. And, um, and the MFA uh, and I, I, very complicated investments. And so I, I think that uh, that was partly why uh, he did not want them, um, he did not want them moved. Um, so I, again, there, there are some details in, in, uh, in one of the uh, latest biographies of Denman Ross about at least three of the special three of the special gifts uh, from, from Ross to the MFA. I think there's, there's something to that. Great, thank you very much. Um, the next question also um, from Jennifer Neeling from Marcy. Uh, loved your talk and your perspective on the archives, especially the focus on sustainability and diversity. It's so great to hear about where the ATA, ATHM collections ended up, which I'm sure many in the field have been concerned about. Are there plans to share this collection in a future exhibition? Yes, so the, that was the 2022 was gonna be a big sort of launch for us. Um, so it sort of remains to be seen because I really do want it to be a physical exhibit um, where people can come and look at, look at these collections. So it kind of COVID has put a pause on that, but the answer is yes, absolutely. There we plan to exhibit it as soon as we can really. Great, well, keep us posted. Um, from Susan Strawn for Angharad, um, what are your thoughts about quilts recording and holding their value and stories over time better than knitting and crochet, which you had alluded to slightly? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Perfect. Um, I suppose, uh, first of all, hi, Susan. Um, uh, you can you can put a you can put a quilt on a wall. Um, it's they're generally flat. They're generally rectangular. Um, there was that sort of breakthrough in the I can't remember the date exactly. Either the early seventies, I think, when uh, quilts were were hung at, in an exhibition environment. I think at the um, Whitney in New York. And uh, again, somebody whose name I forget wrote, wrote a book about it. And there was a lot of comment about, oh, these, um, these, these makers, these, these, they were mainly Amish, do you say Amish? 
um, yeah. makers uh, unwittingly uh, prefigured um, abstract expressionism and colour field painting. Um, and so I think in, in some ways, just that very, um, very obvious physical fact, it makes, uh, makes quilting more, um, it, you, can, you can make a flat rectangular textile into an art object very simply, whereas most knitting and crochet has been used for garments and, and items that don't lend themselves to that sort of treatment. Um, I mean, that's a very sort of obvious common sense approach. Also, um, knitting and, and crochet, that sort of part of textile craft. I mean, if you look through the, the programme for this conference, there is, it has not been um, theorised and studied and problematized in the same way to the same extent as almost any other branch of textiles, um, including quilting. And quilting now has quite a substantial um, discourse of uh, and critique around it um, in a way that, that knitting and crochet uh, have, have not got and have not had. Um, so I, I think um, that's the situation at the moment. There's a, a lot more work to do. Right, thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question for you as well from Madeline Shaw, who compliments all of you on your presentations. Um, but does your collection have much on wartime knitting? Oh, um, hang on, I'm just, uh, I think there was another one as well uh, for me, uh, higher up. But anyway, um, yeah, when our the woman who writes the blog um, is also uh, did quite a lot on second on First World War knitting um, when it was the uh, centenary um, of the end of it in 2018. And uh, we have some, we have no actual artifacts apart from a bandage from either the, of the world wars, but we have quite a lot of uh, patterns and some reproductions. And uh, Barbara has done quite a lot of research about, there were schemes to organize knitting uh, for the troops and, uh, but wool was rationed and so on. Um, and she's done quite a lot of work on that. And, and I think most of it's on her blog. Um, right, so that's, and that's Dr. Barbara Smith. Yes, it is, yeah, right. yeah, Great. Barbara yep. it's again blog. Yeah. Um, yes, I just um, located the other, sorry, now I'm not going in order. Um, the other question about, it's great, it is great to hear about a collection that restored, that records the stories of knitting and crochet. Have you heard about other collections preserving this work, which is not the main focus of textile collections, mainstream textile collections? Um, and this writer says, I remember hearing of an effort in the US to create a knit and crochet database a few years back, but not sure what became of that. Yeah, I can just answer that fairly briefly. Um, mm. I mean, our, our collection is, is, I think, possibly globally unique in that it focuses on our techniques, whereas other collections, fashion collections, will have some knitwear, but it won't be the sole focus. Um, the uh, effort in the US uh, transformed uh, was, there was an inaugural uh, conference in 2012 at, in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and uh, out of that came the Center for Knit and Crochet, uh, which has a, a website and which is now um, building a database of um, artifacts and um, records, visual information where recording people knitting or making things. Um, it won't be a, a, an in real life collection, but it will be a virtual collection and a sort of hub. And we're in discussions um, with each other about how we can feed into what each other do. So yes, yeah, Centre for Knit and Crochet, they, they've got a website and they're on Instagram as well. Great, thank you very much. Um, 
we have a uh, more of a comment about the um, American Textile History Museum. Um, someone writes they visited a number of times and what never in times and watched it become smaller and poorer, and finally close with very little fanfare and no real outrage. The closing of this museum, the building was converted into luxury mill condos by a developer, and the removal of its collections to less accessible academic settings is a story in and of itself. A sad story, in my opinion. It was a great community resource. Um, I didn't know that the building was converted into um, luxury condos, but that's not a huge surprise. Um, yeah, can I just add to that? There, there yeah. was um, the, the Museum of Textiles in Lyon, France, was threatened with closure as well, and I think there was a, a huge outcry about that. There was a huge outcry about that. And I, um, yes, I was part of a group of, well, tens of thousands of people, but we, we um, as a member of the um, CETA directing council as well, we participated um, in that. And the museum is on much firmer footing now. They are, they have real, well, they're not open now, but um, they, are fundraising for an overhaul of their 18th century buildings and of the site as well, but they will stay on site and they will stay in Lyon. But yes, that was, I have to say at the time, that was that was the battle that I was um, more closely involved in. And I don't know, maybe we only had the bandwidth to do one, at the, to, to battle, to, to fight one battle at a time. Yeah, I mean, this one is, the American one is quite shocking, isn't it? And so it is. It is, absolutely. Um, Marcy, did you want to add? I mean, I, I have to say, like, I wasn't as involved with that because I didn't have my position until after right. that had already happened. And I'm, I think it's, you know, it is a fair critique that you once were able to go to one institution to find all of these things, and now they are, they are dispersed. So I, I, I think that it is a fair, a fair critique to say, especially for the people that lived in that community. Um, and so I do think that is part of um, our call at the Kiel Center and certainly at Cornell University to make these as widely available as we possibly can and sort of, sort of be the conduit um, for people who are searching from where, for where these materials ended up um, to let them know where they might have ended up. So um, I do sort of see that as part of my job as sort of being the, the conduit to, to help researchers find those materials and to hopefully be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together again virtually, even if it can't be together again um, physically, um, and to make these available online for everyone to, um, to the extent that I'm able to do that. So I, I certainly see that as part of my charge um, and that I, can, I do understand as a textile enthusiast myself um, that that was, that was a, a loss. Marcy, I'm going to ask you a question which you don't have to answer and I can make it as you know it's more of a statement but I was very pleased to learn of your appointment and I'm hoping that your appointment is a permanent full-time position and not a short-term contract um, that's great because we do see in the field that um, the opportunities for permanent full-time jobs are contracting rather than expanding that that was one of the sort of reasons why Kiel, what the present, you know, the, essentially the reason why it was given to Kiel was that they were willing to create an endowed um, position in order to um, make sure that these materials are pre preserved in perpetuity. Um, that essentially when Cornell takes something, with that is our, that is our, um, that is our statement. Um, we are, we are here to preserve these things in perpetuity. That's great. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, I have, so I have another question. Someone wrote a couple times. I think this is the complete, the complete comment and question here. Um, to all of you, so we'll see if we can get through this. Do you find that making archives and inventories distracts from moving crafts into an artistic field? Are there intentions on giving this model to museums so they capture their own textile stories? And another thought for Maria, my colleagues in the Arts of Europe department at the MFA might be able to help tell you why Ross was so protective 
you've probably been in touch with them, is they oversee all the Monets um, that are always asked to be loaned. Um, I, but I, I, I think this is a very interesting, um, you know, a, a larger discussion that you all have all touched on to a certain extent about um, perhaps archives versus objects. Um, Lauren, would you like to start? Do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a good question. I don't think, for me personally, I don't think that um, it's, it is distracting at all. If anything, I think it perhaps gives them more significance. Um, and I know for my own research, you know, I've been working on this for more than two years. Um, when I couldn't find something about Natalia, I, I would sit with the objects and think about the objects and think about their production um, and think about who might have made them um, and learned about, you know, 19th century rural Russia. Um, and so that maybe was, you know, separated from my 20 minute presentation because it's, you know, only 20 minutes, but there's, there's much more to be to be known, um, but this particularly was a story I wanted um, to tell. So, yeah, I I believe it it gives you know these objects more significance, if anything at all. Um, and you know, my group of objects in particular, um, if it hadn't been for Natalia, they wouldn't exist. So, um, I don't think it is at all distracting. Marcy, you're sort of in a unique position to have the archive completely divorced from the phys physically from the objects. Yeah, I mean, the only objects really are the samples. And those are the um, really the sort of it's what we took is mainly corporate um, archives when you when you when it really comes down to it. Um, but I do think that what's interesting is that um, we're sort of using those archives for a lot of the fashion design and apparel students. Um, so they can sort of see the design process because we do have the weaving drafts, early design records, um, and, then, and then the samples even we have, and the dye books. So you're sort of choosing colors. So sort of the, this idea of that even within the industry, there's there are artistic choices being made. Um, and, and to sort of have that in conversation with what's normally just like, correspondence and business re records and meeting minutes to make sure that, that students understand that these companies existed to produce a product that was going to be judged on some, somewhat on its artistic value, right? So people were going to buy these things or not buy these things um, because they were in fashion or not in fashion. So that was, that was an important part of the process was to hire these designers that were going to represent your um, product to the market and to sort of change with the changing um, changing times. And although we didn't take them, I think that the, the printed cottons especially show the influence of artistic movements on um, cor corporate fabric designers, right? So you can absolutely see like um, Art Nouveau, you can see Art Deco, you can see the 19 sort of 50s, like Astro stuff happening. Um, so I feel like the printed cotton textiles are absolutely an indication of artistic design, you know, just manifested in sort of manufacturing. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that um, I try to highlight the, where art is in, in the design process within these corporate records. That's an, you have an, a different relationship to, you know, the sample books um, mm -hmm. in your collection are connected to the industrial production connected to you. I mean, they're, you know, they're very well documented. Whereas in a number of museum collections in the museums where I have worked, um, we often have sample books that have been corrected, that have been collected for their aesthetic value, but are often divorced from the information about the um, manufacturer or the date even. Um, so it's, it, they occupy these samples and sample books, I think occupy a really interesting place in, in various institutions. And they occupy, they have different status in various institutions. That's something that I've been um, sort of 
trying to grapple with um, for a number of years. So, but I think that the way that they're kept, it sounds like the way that they're kept in your library is perhaps more useful where they are with the documentation that led to their, that led to their manufacture. Um, um, if I may. Uh, yes. Part of a part of the wonder of uh, Lauren's um, story is that uh, one of the thing, one of the stories that I was hoping to tell that I I could not tell because of um, the disruption of COVID is the story of a uh, lace designer, Marion Poes Gray, mm -hmm. and um, I was unable to uh, meet with her family and to sort of piece together some of. Uh, um, her uh, get some of her bobbins and um, and some of the missing laces from sample books that are dispersed all over the country and and um, work in that in in that part of me that is the archivist working with literary executors and preparing inventories for uh, other archives uh, in different parts of the country. And I think it, it's, it's spotting um, a, a missing piece of textile that is found in an article or a journal from the 1920s or 1930s or in another book, but is now not there, not to be found anywhere. Uh, where is it? Has it gone into private hands? Has it gone um, uh, in, in missing in an attic? Um, and uh, the, uh, their great granddaughter doesn't know uh, what it is. So it, it's, it's part of the adventure of, 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 of uh, trying to find these things and, and, and the storytelling. And where has this piece of uh, textile gone? And, uh, and so the adventure continues uh, for another time. Absolutely. Um, we just have about four minutes left. Um, uh, Madeline Shaw has made a note. I just wanna make sure that this, um, the National Museum of American um, Textile History has a very good collection of domestic knitting and crochet, and also lots on yarn manufacturers. It's not a collection that's gotten much play because it is out of fashion within the institution, but people should look for it online and agitate for its accessibility. So there's a collection we can all agitate for now since we've saved the, the uh, museum in Lyon. So thank you to Madeline if she's still here. Um, lots more compliments about the quality of the papers and the articulate nature of all your presentations. Um, and let's see. Uh, compliments about the library collection, finding a home at Cornell from Hannah Rose Shell, who's worked with Madeline Shaw. Um, and we have two minutes left. Um, yes, Ankara. Oh, you need to turn on your uh, sound. Um, there there's one, one with my name on the, um, about synthetic. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Um, um, yes, yeah, it moved uh, to synthetics. Uh, yeah, I'll just answer it very, very quickly. Please um, do. Not, not, not especially, uh, although because of, of when we more or less, when, when the collection ends, we will be starting again um, when we're more actively collecting. Um, but... No, we've got we've got one or two fascinating pieces, very, very, very finely knitted from about the very end of the 50s. But instead of being knitted in very fine wool, knitted in very, very fine, very early brine nylon, and um, which is uh, sort of both sad and interesting, uh, but also wonderful crafts, wonderful making skills being demonstrated. So, yeah. Must have been very challenging to work with. <laughs> yeah, splits terribly. <laughs> so, well, I will thank you all. Lisa does have to close down the room. And um, so I wanna thank you all very much. This was a panel 
with subjects near and dear to my heart and obviously to many other people. We had over 80 people who popped in at one point or another. And um, I wish you all well and thank you to the audience um, and enjoy the rest of the conference.